So I'm excited to see what we can learn today from Just Mercy. Uh, we have the benefit of um, that was made into a movie. So um, we've got a few clips we're going to play. And for those of you who signed in early, you got to see a little bit of the, the beginning of the movie. It is a great movie, although the book is much better, in my opinion, because uh, you can get into a lot of the more interesting stories that the movie couldn't. Um, all right, so a few preliminary things before we uh, get into details again. Um, our book club is focused on making us better lawyers in the courtroom, and so far we've focused specifically on skills in the courtroom, nonverbal communication, cross-examination, closing argument, courtroom strategy. Um, and those are all important, and they are going to be the main focus of our uh, book club, and we're going to talk about that today, too. But we've got some other things that we're going to talk today uh, about today that are more prominent. Um, in my opinion, um, some uh, being a great lawyer in the courtroom, some of that comes down to how we think and even who we are. And Just Mercy gives us the opportunity to, to, to learn, uh, to get better, uh, to really to be better people, but uh, for purposes of the, this book club to be better communicators in the courtroom based on how we think and who we are and kind of lay some foundational uh, skills that, that or uh, I wouldn't even call them skills, but um, something foundational to being a great lawyer. So I'm really excited to talk about this. The skills we're gonna get into are uh, persuading hostile or biased judges and juries. Um, so we will get into that but also the building clock, but <laughs> sorry, the building blocks. We have um, panelists. We have several panelists that you're going to hear from. And again, when, when you raise your hand uh, and we'll get into the details of how we do that, just a quick refresher in a minute, but we'll get to as many of you as, as we can. We just have too many people to get to everyone who raises their hands, but we're going to do our best. We want you to talk. We want to hear from you. Um, the panelists we have today, uh, we have Mel Orchard from the Spence firm, who's going to tell, I hope, uh, my absolute favorite story about Jerry Spence. Um, we have, uh, because this book is focused on criminal law, Harold Pryor, um, who is uh, the next state attorney for Broward County, Florida. Um, we'll hear from Harold in a little bit, but congratulations, Harold, on winning uh, your election. Um, we're going to hear from uh, Madeline Chaber, who emailed me with a really great point about the book. And that's another thing I want to say. If you feel strongly about something in the book or you have a, a, a point that you think is worth mentioning, email me beforehand so we can, uh, we know you have something you feel strongly about. We can try to integrate that. Next month, we're going to go back to a very specific skill discussion on a cross examination and cross, ex cross exam skills. We're going to look at one cross-examination in the book, Presumed Innocent by Scott Turow. I don't want the reading to overwhelm anyone, and I've been hearing that the book a month, uh, for some people, it's not enough, but for some people, it's too much. So every other month, we're going to try to do slightly shorter readings. Next month, if you can't read the whole book, we'll let you know the one chapter that you should read. And by the way, I don't think you have to read the books at all to enjoy uh, and to learn in the book club, but obviously, it's better if you do. All right, so Roland, again, take, please take 30 seconds to explain how we use the hands and how people can talk when they want to talk. Right, good evening, everyone. So unlike some other webinars that you may have attended, we don't use the chat or the Q&A feature in Zoom. Instead, we use the hand raise feature. You should see that somewhere on your console. Let's just do a quick test. Find that button. Everyone raise their hands so we can see that you can find it and we can see on our end that we oh look at that all those hands went up so that's good uh we can then that's great then from from our control we can lower your hand and now everyone's hands are lowered again okay so once again when when the topics come up and you want to discuss them raise your hand uh we may bring you on the screen in that if if that's the case to talk about it it takes a minute when you're going to go on screen it looks like you're disconnecting, but then it reconnects and then you're on the panel. So just give it a second as it, did, as it does its process. Other than that, we should be ready to go. Yeah, and, and we do wanna see you, it's better. Um, it, it, we do have to have that slight pause when we bring people on and off, but it's better when we, when we see you than just hearing the audio. And also, again, please remember, if you don't want us to see you, don't raise your hand. Um, all right, so um, 
let's, uh, we're going to, first thing we're going to talk about to the two building blocks in addition. So we're going to talk about the skill today of uh, persuading hostile judges and juries or, or, or fact finders that are biased against you. But in addition, the building blocks that I'm talking about of being a better person and being a better persuader, a better communicator, a better lawyer are uh, two, blind spots and hope. And so the first thing we're going to talk about is blind spots. There are bad people in the world, but even good people have blind spots. Everyone's got blind spots. And that means you have blind spots. And it means I have blind spots. And so these blind spots make us, uh, I think there's, they're problematic in two ways. The first is they make us less effective persuaders. You need to understand and see accurately before you can persuade people to your point of view. And secondly, it, it often makes us morally complicit in injustice, like we see in the movie in the book. So to get better at winning trials and to be better human beings, we have to search inside ourselves for our blind spots and look for them. And before each trial, that's why we do focus groups. Sometimes they're tactical blind spots, not moral blind spots, but we must identify them. Um, so I want to bring Mel on now. Um, and so we can talk about the blind spots. Um, Mel Orchard is a very good friend of mine. Um, he's been trying cases uh, for over 20 years in the hardest jurisdictions in the country. Um, and uh, he's a faculty member at the Trial Lawyers College. He's board certified trial lawyer uh, by the National Board of Trial Advocacy, the American Board of Trial Advocates. He's in the Summit Council. He's an all around amazing lawyer. Mel, you got to turn your, yeah, there you got to turn the video on. Um, he is, I think, I hope, going to tell us today, too, my favorite, favorite story, not of his. He has a million favorite stories. If I had to pick my favorite story of Mel's, I, I don't know where I'd start. But my favorite story about Jerry Spence, it gives me chills every time I hear it. Well, I've only heard it once. I've told it. I've attempted to tell it. I've pretended to be Mel about 20 times. Uh, <laughs> but um, but so, so, Mel, um, I think that story is somewhat helpful when we're talking about blind spots. So why don't we why don't we start? Do you mind? You know what you know what story I'm talking about in Idaho? No, of, course, yeah, of, course, of course. I mean, I don't know how well you're picking me up. It's saying my my uh, connection's unstable. Maybe that's the mental process. <laughs> but um, if there's any problems, we can do the whole raise hand thing. So let me set the scene. Thank you, John. Uh, appreciate what you said about me. That's nice to hear. So. I mean, let me first say that the people who are out there, um, like Brian, who are on the front lines, not just lawyers, but people part of the Innocence Project who are out there fighting for the lives of these people who are on death row, who are innocent, um, they are the real heroes. Um, my part in it, you know, and, and my part with my partner Jerry was, we were in a trial seeking compensation. Our clients had been exonerated. They had been freed. They spent 25 years in prison for a crime they didn't commit from age 17 to 42, two African-American men who were, were framed of murder. And we were in the, we were in Des Moines, Iowa. Um, the case was in Iowa, uh, seeking justice for the civil rights violations of our clients. And we're in trial and, 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 I don't know how much you want me to set the scene about the case, but it, if you, as we go through the book, the very first person, Walter McMillan, it's so similar. So Terry Harrington and Curtis McGee were two young African-American men in a community in Omaha, Nebraska, where there's a large African-American population. And we can get into the whole history as to why these African-American populations after emancipation went to these towns where there were rivers and there were mills where there was work. So you have along these rivers, Waterloo, Iowa, uh, Omaha, Nebraska, and the Missouri, you have these populations. Well, right across the river from Omaha, Nebraska is Council Bluffs, Iowa. It's 99% white. And when these two men were framed, there was a very popular former police captain who had now become a night watchman at a car dealership. There was a bunch of car thefts. And fast forward, suspect after suspect after suspect didn't turn up. The case gets cold. They start to need to find someone to prosecute. And in 1978, and I'm going to say this in 2020, 
African-American lives are still seen as disposable by some parts of our communities. And that's what they did. And they found these two African-American kids, their alibis weren't great. They weren't criminals, they were innocent and they framed them. So fast forward. Yeah, your First, trial your trial is the civil trial that started after they've been exonerated. Yes, there was boxes of exculpatory information that was uncovered. Just a, a, a barber in, in, the, uh, in the Iowa State Penitentiary fell in love with one of my clients and believed him. And remember Shawshank Redemption, the old adage is everybody, everybody in here is innocent. Well, as we know, there are a lot of people who are innocent in prison. She believed him. She went back to Council Bluffs, asked for the information on the Schwer murder. And lo and behold, nine boxes of information that had never been provided were provided. All right, so you've got a good case, but you've got, it's a, it, you, you're not sure, you, you're, you're now in a 99% white jurisdiction, right? Well, Des Moines, Iowa isn't quite as bad, but that's how, remember, this is how they were prosecuted. They didn't really care how they squeeze these kids and manipulate these kids and, and threaten them of murder. They had, they, had to get a pro, they had to get a conviction. That's how it happens. Um, and so anyway, we're now 25 years forward. We're in Des Moines, Iowa. We have a trial and Jerry Spence is doing the, doing the voir dire. And it's hard because we're going, how do we approach this without calling people racist? How do we tell people, listen, we know some of you are racists. You know who defends their racism the most? Racists, right? They never want to admit that. It's the blind spot you were just talking about. Yeah, so, so let me, I, I'm gonna let, I'm not gonna interrupt you once you get rolling on but just to make sure with the background set, you guys had a very limited time for voir dire, if I'm, if I'm correct, like 10 minutes or something very short, am I wrong? Well, so it's Federal District Court, Judge Pratt, amazing human being. Unlike most Federal District Courts, he allowed more voir dire, but not a lot. So we had to hit the main issues first. So out of the box, let me set the scene. All white jury. Venire panel behind is all white. We got a smattering, one or two African-Americans, maybe, maybe one Hispanic. Everybody else is white. I'm white, Jerry's white, counsel's white. Our two African-American clients, the police over there, who are young, we say racists back in 1970, 78. They look like tired old men now. So this case is a lot more daunting than we thought it was going to be. And Jerry stands up in front of this jury. And um, we, we've been talking, how do, we, how do we own it? And Jerry says, well, I'll do my Jerry Spence impression. If anybody's offended by that, I'll do it. Well, I, I have something inside of me, and it's, it's ugly, and I hate it. It's inside, and I don't ever want to admit it. Do you know? And it's this piece of me that's racist, a little bit, this part of me that I hate so much. There's a little piece of me that's racist. And he looks at the jury, he says, is there any part of that in you? Any piece of that in any of you? And we're at counsel table and the judge's eyes are like this and the jury's looking around and they're nervous and it feels like 10 minutes goes by. And it might, have made, it might have been maybe a minute and a half, two minutes, John, and, and I'm just petrified. And Jerry just stands there looking at him, just looking at each of the jury's faces. Finally, this, this young woman in the far left corner goes, Mr. Spence, I, I don't like to use the word racist, but maybe, maybe I stereotype. Stereotype, that's the word, you found the word. That's the word I've been looking for, stereotype. Well, I guess it's just you and I. Yes, <laughs> so that, it's so brilliant. The, go was, ahead. I wish I could have this transcript, in, and I've kept the transcript because it's so beautiful, because it was so real, because he was admitting something that's true in many, in many of us. We all have it. It's part of something, and it's something, that, you know, we didn't ask for. It's learned. Racism is learned. And that's got the conversation started. Well, maybe I do that too, Mr. Spence. And I guess, uh, you know, you're right. We do, I'll do, thank you. And why do we, and so now we're having a conversation about race. So and, go ahead. Uh, well, so let me just make a couple of comments about that. Then we're going to, I'm going to ask you because you're so often going into jurisdictions where 
there's some bias against you or your case or your client, or they're hostile in some way for your thoughts on that. And then I want to get everyone's thoughts on, on how yeah. we deal with that. But let me just make a few comments on, on what Mel told us. So first of all, you're going in your voir dire, you have to identify people who are going to be bad for you. And a lot of times they don't know what you're asking is true about them. Like they don't think they're racist, even though they are, right. or they don't want to admit it in front of everyone. So, yeah. Jerry's lowering the barriers by saying it's in me okay right. who am I to criticize him but he did choose the wrong word but but his genius was that when he said it he just had faith in his what you guys teach I've never been to trial or his college but from what I hear is to trust the jury and yeah. someone the so jury will save you and some that young woman came forward to save him and right. then she gave him the right word and then he was like smart enough to grab it well it wasn't the wrong word but it wasn't their word. And what happens is when you're listening to the jury, they start to give you a language that they're gonna use later on. And when they give you a language that's consistent with the language you might be using, you use that language. So we stereotype people, we make assumptions about who they might be, and we don't even know who they are, but we make assumptions, don't we? It's, say more about that, I wanna hear it from you. So they're developing this language. He's meeting them where they are. Yeah, and I think you're going to tell us more about that when we get into talking to, you know, persuading hostile juries. But just know, everyone, you guys know I love disagreements. I want people on here to disagree with me. I agree, with, I disagree with Mel and Jerry about whether that was the wrong word, and I'll tell you why, Mel. And, and I'm wrong. I always say that. Listen to the smart people, not me. But racist uh, uh, prejudice, racist, those words are much higher barriers for people to admit than stereo, Agreed. right? So you want to lower barriers there. And right, then but he admitted a higher barrier, John. I hear what you're saying, but he admitted a higher barrier in him, and that gave everyone permission to come below that with a different word. Yeah, so but he asked them if they were the, the same as him. But anyway, listen, I right. see your okay. That's a good point. That's a good point. Let me just say one other great thing that I know we can agree with. Agree on. Oh, it's so brilliant. The part that gives me chills is, it's, I guess it's just you and me, right? Yeah. Okay, now, now everyone else has to come in to save that poor woman. And they, they're, it's, they're, they're, they want to save her and they're pushed to, to, to talk honestly. Right, and if you'd shared away from it, see, people don't act when they're in an unfamiliar play, place unless they're enlisted to act. They have to be incentivized to act. There has to be a need for us to act. And he presented the need. I guess it's just you and I who are racists. Now he uses you and I because he wanted to end it with who are, you know what I mean? So, but that's how Jerry speaks. But he wanted some solidarity and to present a need. And it's, and it is really, it's brilliant and innate in him. Uh, yeah. But we try to teach that anyway. Okay, all right. So now, um, uh, so everyone knows where we're turning now. I'm going to play a clip uh, and I want you guys to start thinking about tips we can give each other on how things you've done as specific or general as you want to convince difficult, hostile fact finders, juries, judges. Let me just read you one thing from the book. Uh, this is the hearing before, the, before that guard's mind was changed. And there were several things we know from the book that changed his mind. And, but uh, Brian says, I wanted the judge to understand that we weren't simply defending Mr. McMillan from a different angle. I wanted him to know we had dramatic new evidence of innocence that exoner exonerated Walter and that justice demanded an immediate release. We wouldn't succeed if the judge didn't know how to hear the evidence. A very strange thing to say. Nothing about the evidence. He wanted to start by telling the judge how to hear the evidence. And that is something that sounds to me similar to what I've heard you, Mel, say about having to go meet the jury where they are, or the judge in this case. So, so tell us a little more about that. So um, it starts with, um, you know, we, we talk about empathy, it's role reversal. So if you just take that guard, for example, what did that guard love? Um, you know, even Confederate flag and racism and you know, we are all still human beings. We love our mothers. We love our children. Um, you start at those basic, basic base levels. And some people don't. And they're, you know, I think they're evil. I think they're the outliers. But most of us 
have those basic loves and you meet them where they love. And so if you reverse roles with things that are loving and endearing in people, you start to find out what make, what motivates them. Where's our common story, right? And so in that clip, you see him looking at his family. Well, if that person in chains now is a human being with a family, that makes him certainly a lot more like the guard now. And just glimpses of compassion and real empathy allow us to move into a place where, I mean, they talk about this in terms of refugee situations in Africa. The teaching is how do we get them to understand these are people with families, real people, not Hutus and Tutsis and not different tribes and not people, but, but people who have families. You meet them where they are at the most basic level of humanity and you grow and you grow together from there in the story. So, yeah, so, um, and in, in the book, there's more about those commonalities between the guard that the guard found out uh, at the hearing. But so when we're going to a jury, um, you know, get, get, just give it, and, and so everyone else knows, raise your hand if you've got a question for Mel on this or your own tip for how to uh, handle a difficult jury. But I wanna ask Mel a question while you guys are thinking about that and raising your hand. So can you just get a little more specific because Obviously, yeah, okay, I, if I can find some things that I believe and the jurors believe, or I believe and this judge believes, and I can start from that, that place, um, it sounds like a great idea. But what does that mean? I mean, it, it just sounds so general. What, what, how, do, how help a lawyer who's in yeah. the court? So, so, I mean, and this is why we start from danger points, because we start from our scariest place in our cases because what that often does is it draws out people's kind of worst ideas. But the minute you start to polarize, and, and Rick Friedman's talked a lot about this too, once you start to polarize them, they, they, they want to push back. Like for instance, if you use the word racist, nobody wants to be a racist. I don't want to be a racist. I mean, and the racists defend their racism the hardest. And so they'll start to make all kinds of excuses. I'm not a racist. I mean, and so when you polarize, like for instance, I had a case, uh, I think I've maybe talked about this before, African-American client who was drinking and had a, a marijuana in his system and got in a crash. Well, a cop caused the crash. He didn't cause the crash, but you know, I've got an alcohol, I got a kid who's, who's, who's drunk driving. And so I open with that. Hey, folks, I want to I want to talk to you about something that's really important to me, and I know it's important to you. Drunk driving, drunk driving kills people. I hate drunk driving. I mean, I, I've got a personal story in my family with someone who was hurt by a drunk driver. I wonder how you might feel about that. I hate drunk driving. Yeah, it causes all kinds of problems. I mean, yeah, I had a kind of like an uncle and a cousin, and this gal got killed, and it's awful. It's dangerous, it's dangerous isn't it? It's dangerous. But, but Mel, you know, there's some extent, and, and in Florida and um, most of the jurisdictions, other states that I'm in, I have a lot more opportunity to strike jurors than you do. Often, even if you get people to reveal that they're biased against you or your case, you still have them on your jury. So they hate drunk driving. So, so then what? Yeah. Okay, you still got a drunk driver. Mm -hmm. where, where, how, you, you meet them where they are. Tell me, where, 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 how do you do that? How'd you do it in that case? Well, Here's the deal. I mean, when you polarize them at the very end, I mean, you take them all the way to the end, and and uh, you know we've called it the absurd extreme at the college. Jerry's done this. Well, I guess we should all just go home. Then. I'm sure you don't want to hear anything more about what was happening. I mean, let's go home. If my client was drunk, no matter how the crash happened, it's his fault, isn't it? Well, people will go. Well, I don't know about that. I maybe hear a little bit more. Well, he had a green light and the police officer ran a red light, but he's drunk, so he, he shouldn't get justice, right? I mean, he doesn't deserve justice. And what you have is you'll have people go, well, actually, I, I don't know. I mean, I had an uncle who actually was drunk and got in a crash and the lady found out I was drunk and she lied about the stop sign. What I'm saying is, and you're right, you know, uh, and th this is something we've talked about in voir dire. You raise those, those we say, these, these, these danger points, these poisonous issues, and then you're able to use peremptories or cause challenges with, with judges who are sympathetic to that. And you can get rid of these people and have a, a jury that looks more like the jury you'd like to have. In my, in my place, I think I've had cause in 27 years of trying cases, more than 50 jury trials. I don't even know anymore. Um, I've had judges uh, grant cause challenges maybe three times in my entire career. Wow. It does not happen in 
North Dakota, South Dakota, Arizona, Wyoming, Idaho, Utah, all the jurisdictions, where, where I've practiced, California, I haven't in a couple of years, but, but, but my point is, is that you better find a way for them to, to, you meet them where they are so they can come together as a tribe and fix the issue. When they've already been to the, the outside of drunk driving, now they're meandering back to a place where, well, drunk driving may have caused it, but it might not have. I'm open to hear more of the evidence about how the crash actually happened. And now right. the prejudice about drunk driving maybe has been eclipsed by some idea of I want to find out more. So while we're bringing Herb Cohen on, uh, who has either a tip or a comment or a question, we'll find out in a minute. Um, but while it takes a minute for him to come on, Mel, so is it fair to say, look, there's more than one value. Every human being has more than one value. Yeah. And so when you, they're biased against, or the judge is biased against one of your parts of your case. You have <laughs> to find another value that they agree with you on that that will compel winning your case. You must find yes. that value. Yes, and you, but you really, here's the, here's the, here's the Yoda move. Here's the move the rocks with, you know, with Luke on your backpack move. Is you can, if you know and do focus groups and you know those values are out there, when you present the other, the other value and you're patient and you listen and you let them kind of start to talk as the, as the voir dire, those values will come up naturally. And then instead of a lawyer feeding them a value that you want them to have, they come up with it and suddenly it's their value. And they're the ones that are now championing this cause with a value you always hoped they'd have and they're bringing it forward. By the way, if it doesn't happen in voir dire, you're not going to feed it to them. You're not going to manipulate them. So if they don't come up with it, like I say, spread the poison. If they don't find the cure, you're dead. You took a bad case. When they find it, you're going to live and you're going to win because they're going to be the champions. And if you let them do it and trust them, it's going to happen. All right. Well, I disagree with you about some of that, but we'll talk about that another day. Herb, what do you got? John, hi. Good. Can you hear me? Yep. Oh, great. This is wonderful. I'm glad that I came in on this and it's, it's great and informative. Here, here's what I was going to add into this. Uh, I've been a trial lawyer going on 42 years. <laughs> and, uh, and, and you know my background, I was a state and federal prosecutor, I'm a criminal defense lawyer now. In reference to what you all are talking about and great tips, I've had those situations and I've used the word preference. I got around, instead of bias, I got around it in a couple of cases where it was an obvious situation with many African-American or black people I represented. And I, during voir dire, talked about the word preference. Let's talk about preference. Preference is so easy. Things were taught like pizza. You like it a certain way, I like it another way, or maybe you don't like it. And I developed that, letting, having the jurors weigh in on, because it's very easy for them to talk about the type of car they'll buy, the type of food they like, that's preference. Preference is not, in my mind, that much further away from prejudice or bias. Yeah. It's choice and what your perceptions are. And then you see, and then I developed it into seeing someone already assuming they might have done this because of what they look like and who they are. But I put it together that way, and the jurors were very comfortable talking about it. I like it. All right. So, um, her. Thank you. Mel, thank you. Feel free to raise your hands as we go. I would want to bring on two other people now. Um, so you'll go off, but we can bring you back at any time. We're going to bring on Harold uh, Pryor and Madeline Chaber. Um, while they're coming on, let me just introduce them. Harold has been president of uh, the Broward County uh, TJ Reddick Bar Association. He served as an assistant state attorney. He's, he's worked at several firms over the years, including most recently at our firm. Um, and he's always uh, worked for genuine criminal justice. He will be Broward's next state attorney. Uh, for people outside of Florida, that's the, uh, like a district attorney up north or the chief prosecutor. And then Madeline, um, she's uh, not only a trial lawyer, but a jury consultant, a member of the American Board of Trial Attorneys and the American Society of Trial Consultants. She works on product cases, mass torts, um, asbestos, tobacco. Uh, Madeline, if you can turn your video on. She, um, she emailed me a great point and a reminder again, if you guys see something in the books, uh, email me uh, that you think is important to discuss. But before we get into that specifically, uh, or actually my questions are related to that, I want to ask you guys a few things. Uh, 
So look, whether we're talking about prosecutors who, you, there was prosecutorial misconduct in this book, obviously. Um, but whether you're talking about prosecutors who betray justice for the politics, for the win, for the, the, the need to win, or defense attorneys who, as Madeline pointed out, are betraying their clients by being lazy or drunk or even intentionally complicit. How do we as lawyers, what do we do about that, about lawyers in our midst who are betraying justice or their clients? So Harold, Madeline, I'd like to hear from both of you on that. Yes, uh, first and foremost, John, thank you so much. This is such a powerful book. I actually read it the second time uh, leading up to this because it's a powerful book and it's had an impact on me and reinforced why I wanted to be a prosecutor in the first place, why I chose to be a prosecutor over a public defender, because I realized that there were gross inequities in the criminal justice system. Uh, but whenever you're faced with a scenario like that, when one of your colleagues, um, you see them, you know, getting ready to cross that line. And, I, and, I'll, and I'll qualify this. Not all prosecutors and law enforcement, people on that side of the aisle are bad people. Most of them are in this job, in this profession to do the right thing. But some people are faced with that dilemma. Some things can be seen as game and ship, and it might not be that clear uh, Brady versus Maryland uh, violation where you have exculpatory evidence that could uh, deem someone probably innocent and, and not have committed that particular crime. But it goes back to your moral compass. It goes back to you being who you are, trusting your gut, and always wanting to do the right thing. Uh, we need prosecutors, law enforcement officers who are willing to do everything right and, and, and aim to be responsible and to do everything right through every stage of the prosecutorial process. And so that comes with you being willing and able to stand up and speak out when you see some form of injustice or you see that prosecutor that's willing to cheat and, 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 and commit a Brady violation. And um, that's important. And that was one takeaway that I took from this book in life experiences as a state attorney is that what an incredible power we have as prosecutors, as state attorneys or DAs um, to do the right thing. And um, we're faced with that and it shouldn't be a dilemma. But we should always have that moral compass, that guiding light inside of us to always want to do the right thing. And if you trust that, I guarantee you'll do the right thing. You'll be willing to speak up and speak out. Because at the end of the day, I think all of us, we want an outcome, a favorable outcome, but we want to do it the right way. We want to obtain it the right way. Uh, we don't yeah, want to cut well, corners and actually do it. Not most of us. Most uh, of you hope. Not, not right? everyone. <laughs> um, hope. So, yeah. So Madeline, let me get your thoughts. And anyone who wants to comment or ask either of them questions, uh, go ahead and raise your hand. Uh, Madeline, go ahead. Well, I think in the, in the context of the situations we were looking at um, in the book, which are, you know, this isn't a fictional book. These are all real situations. There seemed to be a complicity between everybody. So the judges don't care. The, you know, they just all want a conviction. It's like, let's get this done uh, as quick as possible. Um, clearly, we're, you know, not going to get fair juries under those situations. And, uh, you know, there's nobody there at that point to, to call someone out on it. And what disturbs me, you know, less even than then the state screwing up and the judge screwing up is that a defense attorney takes on a position, you know, where his client is the important thing, not the conviction, you know, the, the client. And it, it seems like nobody cared in the least, um, you know, and if they weren't complicit, they were lazy or sleeping or whatever and i don't think i think that's still happening now i think it's um you know and I, i'm not sure how you you call that out when everyone in the in the courtroom is behaving that way i, I you know I, I mean i'd love you to be the prosecutor you'd probably call out the uh the defense lawyer, Harold. It was, business, it was business as usual. It was business as normal. You know, I come from a fifth generation of, of, of family members who grew up in the South, fifth generation uh, family members that grew up here in, in Florida. And we saw the racism um, that you saw in this book. Uh, uh, it, was, it was in every instance of every institution 
It's ingrained in the education system. It's ingrained in the economic system in these small towns. It's ingrained in the criminal justice system. And it's even ingrained in even in the defense bar, right? In that particular area, you saw that where it's, you know, well, he's black, uh, he, he fit the description, he must have did it, but hey, I'm here as the court appointed attorney, so I'm, I'm just gonna stamp my time card and I'm, I'm gonna be here. Um, that was a problem. That's a systemic issue that we've seen in the criminal justice system. And so that's why we need prosecutors who are willing to do the right thing. We need prosecutors that understand these communities, understand that we have a criminal justice system that quite frankly has been systemically stacked against people of color and poor people. And so when you say that, it's not just a black and white issue. I'm not saying you just need black state attorneys or prosecutors or, or Hispanic prosecutors, but you need prosecutors that understand that we have a system that has been systemically stacked against certain demographics. And, and, and I think if we start there, um, I think we can fix the issue. I think Mel brought up a great point. Um, and, and also John with the blind spots, right? Um, it's easy for us to look at someone and discount them and just totally write them off. Me as a black man, if I see someone with a Confederate tattoo and I see their truck stickered up, I'm writing him off. But we saw that once we saw those layers peel back a little bit more, we understood that there was a deeper issue there and there was opportunity, room for me as an advocate to reach this individual and, and, and potentially flip them my way. And so it, it goes both ways. And, that, and that's the beauty of trial work, this thing that we do. Yeah, and you don't always have, you, don't, you never get to pick who's tr deciding your case. You know, if you have a case and you have racist jurors, well, you, you can't give up. You still got to win. So that's why you have to find a way, like with that guard, to speak to the people on your jury, whoever they are. Um, you know, you could go back to, we're going to read Devil in the Grove at some point and of what Thurgood Marshall was doing. You, know, you talk about hostile juries. We got it easy. Um, all right, let me bring on Rima Bartowell, who's got a question or comment for you. And while she's being brought in, to, the, to everybody, all the participants, I'd love to get some of you, after Rima gives her question or comment, I want to ask you something. And, I, and whoever uh, wants to comment on this, please raise your hand. But how, what I'd like to ask is, how can we as lawyers, what ideas do you have that what can we do personally, or maybe even in terms of trying to change the system, but really what I'm talking about is what we can do personally to try and make sure that in our cases and in cases in general, wealth is not such a factor, especially in criminal justice, but also in civil disputes and rent disputes. The, the wealthier party should not always win. Um, so any ideas about that or stories, go ahead and raise your hand. And, um, and in the meantime, Rima, go ahead, please. Well, um, I wanted to say that, hi, it was, it's uh, great to be here. Thank you. It, you know, there's an old quote I remember with uh, Edmund Burke, it, all that is necessary for evil to triumph is for good men, and I add women, to do nothing. And it's really easy to do that because to try to do something, especially like what he did in, this, in his life's journey, it's like he said, I'm tired at the end of the book. I'm, you know, he says, I'm tired. And we get tired doing some of our own civil cases when we see our own little judicial injustices where a judge gives you an order with one sentence on something you had a three-day trial or a special set big thing. And you know he, he or she didn't even read the law, didn't even pay attention, was distracted, and that upsets us. But these issues in this book are people's lives, people that are being wrongfully murdered realistically when they're put to death illegally, in my opinion. This is like state sanctioned murder and you know i mean it's it's i've been work i was i read this book before the club because i'm working on something of my own on this whole issue and yesterday i was watching you know um i don't know it was cnn and you see um blake's family and the, i think the uncle said something which is very interesting like you see the, the the guy who was walking with the machine gun the 17 year old guy Shootings just happened, people were just killed, and the cops drove right by him, and he's holding the machine gun. Nothing happens to him. But then you have little Tamir Rice with a, with a toy gun shot to death, not to mention the other guy, Blake, shot seven times in the back, but the white kid walking down the street with an assault rifle right there, they just drove right by him. And this is the system. And, you know, no matter, I don't know how people are so crazy. And then, then they had the attorney general on the news saying there is no systemic racism. And 
you know, it's, it's like, who, who are they talking to? It's like, when you have that and half the country is sadly like that, it's like you're, you, you can't reason with that. I don't know. Like, well, I, like that well, I, that voice. Did, I disagree with you about that. Cause that's our job. Right. Well, I mean, I like the voir dire. The other, um, the other attorney, that's Mel Orchard, was talking about the voir dire questions. I, I actually like the way you get people maybe to admit it and get the people who are maybe more racist, which whatever word you want to use, whether you want to call it stereotype, like you said, or something lesser than that, like preference. Um, however you want to use it, maybe that's the only way to slowly win people over. And I guess the country has improved because that's why we're seeing things that are happening now. But it's just to me so so slow. What what Spence and Mel can come on and correct me if I'm wrong. But what he was doing there is two things. One, he was identifying people so he could right know, for sure. Could, but secondly, he was starting a conversation among the jurors so that they for could sure. come up with a value uh, that that where he could meet them that that he could agree with. And you can go on the journey together to see that this is wrong and maybe we can fix this and you're part of the solution even though you had these kind of issues yourself. So yeah. it was very clever, I liked it. Brian's book is really, really good about not writing anyone off, not writing off the murderer and not writing off the racist. Very, very really neutral. A special human being, yeah. And, but that's what you gotta think, you have to communicate with everyone. All right, thank you, Rima. Let me just bring um, Herb Cohen back on, who's raising his hand, I hopefully to talk about wealth in the criminal justice system. Then we're gonna take our break for the drink and we have a really awesome ending. Uh, but let, let's see what Herb has to say, hopefully about wealth in the system. You're, you're on mute, you're on Herb. Mute. I'll have a signal, like I'll go like this. Can you hear signal. me now? Unmute. Hello, can you hear me? <laughs> yes? Yes. Good. I'm going to answer you quickly about wealth in the system. No question about it. I, I would, if you have money and you can hire lawyers like me, it's different. I don't want to get into that. I want to disagree with what this woman was saying, where it's not the system. And I want to say something to Mr. Pryor, this young man. I spent a lot of time in Broward as a prosecutor. It's you. It's the individual person. You hit on it, John. It's not the system. It's what we do and who we are. I've always had a saying from day one. If you suspect an injustice, can you help but seek it out? If you find an injustice, can you help but care? When I was a prosecutor here in Broward, I had supervisors I went to for help. I'll tell you Billy D. I'll talk about him because he's a well-respected federal judge now, William Demetrius. When I'd walk into his office, he'd pull files out. Let's see what we can do to do this the right way. People don't do that. When I went to Janet Reno's office in the drug unit, if you have the right person, when Mr. Pryor becomes the state attorney and he will, it's up to him. It's up to how Mr. Satz handled the office and kept their eyes closed to just let things go without the individual as a lawyer with your license on the wall taking the reins of your case and doing the right thing. And that's gonna make the difference. The system only changes when we, the people in it. I have done that in my cases. I've got my head handed to me at times, but you do, when you go home at the end of the day, John and folks, Mr. Pryor, and you look at a case and give it the time to look at and do the right thing, win, lose, or draw, you tried, and that's what's gonna change the so-called system. It's not going to change without each of us doing that the way we could do it. I remember quickly, I'll tell you a case I had in North Carolina with a murder, with a, with a death penalty. And when I went up there, I went to the little courthouse, I forget the little town, and there was a security guard waiting for it. Mr. Cohn, you're the lawyer from Miami? Well, actually, I'm from Fort Lauderdale, and I'm Jewish, so whatever. Oh, the judge is waiting for you. Oh, wow, great. Invites me into chambers. Here's the prosecutor sitting next to him. I'm going, oh, I'm in trouble. Well, don't worry, Mr. Cohen, because the prosecutor's wife is my secretary. Okay. These are, you know, you talk about experiences, but I had to stand up and say, here's what's right about this case and my client, and here's what's wrong about this case. So now you guys do the right thing. It's up to us as individuals, Mr. Pryor. I'm looking forward to you being there. Well Thank said. You, Thank, Thank you. you. All right, so um, we're going to do our uh, 
uh, we're going to bring Mac, the bartender, on. He's going to show us how to make a drink, which we always do at this time. And then afterwards, we're going to open up for general comments or discussions. So if you're thinking about what you want to talk about. Um, but first, uh, we're going to bring on Mac. And then uh, we sent some uh, liquor bottles to some volunteers who are going to make the drink. Uh, which we do each month. So I don't know if we know who you are, but if uh, maybe you could raise your hand if you volunteered and we sent you a um, some liquor bottles. <laughs> what are we making today? I guess Mac will tell us. Got Mac, Kay, Megan. Hey, Karen. All right, so guys, feel free to leave your volume on. I think it'll be fun to hear what you guys say when you're um, when you're making them, either successfully or not. And remember, this is four minutes. We'll be back to the to the uh, book in a in a short time. All right, Mac, go ahead. Thank you. Awesome. Hey, everyone. My name is Mackenzie Gleason, uh, but you can all call me Mac. You just said it's uh, if you weren't here in the previous session. Uh, I work at a bar in the East Village called The Whaler. Today, I'm going to be teaching Kay, Megan, and Karen how to make a delicious Paloma, along with all of you. So Kay, Megan, Karen, make, please make sure that you guys have unmuted so we can have a nice little back and forth as we make this cocktail and everybody can hear you guys. So before we go any further, let's just talk a little bit about the ingredients that we're going to be using today, along with any of the tools that we're going to be needing and the alternative tools in case you don't have what I have at your house. So for today, we're going to need some shaking tins right here. If you don't have a two-piece shaker set, no worries. You might have like a one-piece shaker set. If you don't have that, you can totally use a mason jar, which is great because it doubles as both a strainer with the top and also your drinking vessel. So if you don't have that, maybe you have a neutral bullet top, you can use that. It's fantastic. Otherwise, no worries. The strainer, we're gonna need one of those, especially if you're using a two-piece shaker. As I said before, if you have a mason jar, no need. If you don't have one, you can even use like a wooden cooking spoon. The name of the game is just keeping the ice in there while not restricting the flow of liquid. Now, okay, Megan, Karen, you guys, you focus, you listen, here we go. So, ingredients that we need. We got lime juice. I know you guys have it. Everybody else, we're going to be using agave today. We're also going to be using grapefruit juice. And last but not least, Kay, Megan, and Karen, what do we need? Tequila. Exactly. Today I'm going to be using some Don Julio and Yeho, but you can be sure to use whatever tequila is that you like. Blanco, Yeho, Reposado, any brand. It's going to taste great in this cocktail. Now, real quick, I'm just going to go over the steps we're going to do, use in order to make the cocktail. We're going to be using a half ounce of lime juice, a half ounce of agave, one and a half ounces of the grapefruit juice, and then one and a half ounces of the tequila as well. So if you don't have right here, this is a jigger, a, a tool used to measure the liquids to pour into, there we go, perfect, looking great, Baron pour our liquids into our tins, then you can totally use measuring spoons. Now, a half ounce is equal to one tablespoon. So here's a little pop quiz, okay, Megan or Karen, a half ounce is equal to one tablespoon, then one and a half ounces is equal to what? A tablespoon, a teaspoon and a half. <laughs> Three tablespoons, close. We got I, have it. Better, I have a better question. Yes, stop me. Is it the big part or the small part? Don't worry, we're going to that. So the smaller portion is equal to one whole ounce, and the bigger portion on your jigger is probably equal to one and a half. So you're going to okay. use the bigger portion twice for the tequila and the grapefruit juice, and then you're going to eyeball halfway down from the smaller portion for a half ounce, all right? So let's get started. Press for time. I believe in all of you, my trusty bartenders, Kay, Megan, and Karen. Let's get this going. We're going to do a half ounce first of lime juice, all right? Five pounds, small portion, right into our shaker set. You got this? You got it, Megan? Here we go. Next, yeah, come on, you got it. Next, we're gonna do a half ounce of agave, all right? Remember, 
If you're not using a jig or a half ounce is equal to one tablespoon. After that, we're gonna do what? Ounce and half of grapefruit juice. All right, Kay, you good? You got it, Kay? Yeah. All right, go. One and a half ounces of grapefruit juice right into that jigger. Or three tablespoons and a measuring spoon. Now we got our lime juice, we got our agave, we got our tequila in there. What are we missing? Excuse me, I already gave you the answer. Call it out, so we got tequila. <laughs> One and a half ounces of our tequila as well. Voila, right into the tin. Now, as you can see, I already salted my glass. If you don't like salt, no worries. If you do, you can go ahead and just rub a little bit of lime juice, sprinkle some salt on there. So we have everything in the tin. What are we missing? Karen, what are we missing? What's next? Tequila. Ice. Tequila oh. is already in there. Ice I started with ice. I was ahead of you on the ice. Okay, don't <laughs> worry. We're gonna make it work. Right, let's go ahead and put the ice in the shaking tin, all right? Now, when you shake, just make sure that the steel is tight so you don't splash that cocktail all over your face. All right, here we go. We're going to get a nice little hard shake. Shake it up, shake it up. There we go. Okay, you good? You shaking? Here we go. All right, we're all shaking. All right. That's it. That's enough. Now we're going to put ice in our glass. I kind of already beat us to the punch, but whoever has it put ice in their glass, get some ice in there. Now, if you want to put club soda, you have it. Now's the time. You're going to put it in the glass right now on the bottom. And then we're going to strain the cocktail over the top of that so that you get a nice carbonation throughout the entirety of the cocktail as opposed to pouring it on top. Let's go ahead and strain our cocktail to our glass. If you want, you can cut a little lime wheel garnish or a lime wedge. Let's go ahead and put that on top. You're all doing a great job. There you go, Meg. All right, cool. Okay, Karen. Fantastic. You got that? That's it. Just take a little sip and enjoy a little delicious Paloma. Now, I know there's someone out there who maybe doesn't drink. I'm also about to be nine years sober, so if you want to make this into a non-alcoholic version, you can just do three quarters of an ounce of grapefruit juice, I mean, excuse me, of lime juice and agave. Do an ounce and a half of the grapefruit juice again, and then just add a little bit more club soda, maybe like two ounces to make up the lack of tequila, and voila, you have a non-alcoholic version of your flow. Yeah. So that was really good, but can I ask you a favor? Because you were speaking so quickly and I was trying to mix at the same time. <laughs> yeah. Will you send John an email with the actual measurements, and then he can send it to everybody who's on the call? Yeah, fantastic. That's that. a great idea. And next time we'll do that beforehand. So if whoever volunteers for next time, we'll, we'll send you the instructions along with the uh, alcohol. Awesome. Thank you guys. We really appreciate it. Thank you for the gift box. It was fabulous. Uh, yes. Where did you say you were a bartender? Uh, in the East Village of New York City at the Wayland, all the way on East 9th Street. I used to bartend in the West Village. Oh, awesome. Okay. Thank you guys. Thanks a lot. All right. Thanks. Okay, so um, I, we have a, a little bit more that I want to talk to you about, probably about 10 minutes, but before we get to that, I think, uh, I think it'll be really good uh, ending. Um, I want to open it up. You know, this is a, this is a really inspirational book, um, I think, and um, it has a lot of lessons about what we can accomplish. Is there anything that, uh, raise your hand if you've got a comment or a question or something that you want to talk about in regard to the book. So I'm not hijacking the entire uh, event. Anyone? All right, we'll bring on Carl. And if anyone else, you can raise your hand as well. All right, Carl, so you got to unmute and video and tell us your thoughts. Yeah, because I have an old computer that doesn't have any, but you can hear me, right? Yeah, we can hear you. Very brief background. Um, at the age of 70, I got a law degree. I do something else, but I do a lot of family law. I do it all pro bono. So obviously I don't do trials. I don't do jury, but I've read every book you're ever going to talk about. The thing about the discussion thus far that disturbs me a little bit is 
if those jurors had been racist or non-racist, they would have had to come to the same legal conclusion because the only evidence brought for was a lying, as it turned out, a lying uh, eyewitness to the uh, murder. Uh, the problem, always systematic, the attorney who was later disbarred got paid a thousand dollars to handle a capital crime, never bothered to un uncover the fact that it was a fish fry that this guy was at all day, didn't recover the first confession of this person, and didn't, uh, uh, I mean, really just didn't present a case. So those jurors, whether they were biased or not biased, what choice would they have had other than find the guy guilty when the only witnesses brought to the stand is uh, an eyewitness. And also, if you want to talk a, just a second about your issue, which I'm, I was in uh, the legislature for eight years before I was a lawyer, but I headed up civil justice at one point, and I've given a lot of thought since I got to this sort of inequity of, of finances. Now, in family law, there is there is a, a fee shifting uh, thing, but 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 and it. And in criminal law, I, I, as I understand it, as I understand it, uh, they're supposed to be more competent counsel. But my answer to your question would be two. One is, at least in family law, my suggestion, I, I thought about this because I recently ran again, I lost. We ought to have a safe harbor for people that will do low bono work. I know at least in family law, some people won't do it because their firms tell them they don't have insurance coverage uh, for it. And then secondly, we need people like you to go to the bar and bring to the bar the ideas to make it more just, and then they bring it to the legislature. Because as you know, judges can't talk to the legislature and you're not a big voice individually. So I covered a lot of ground and I'll listen. I appreciate that, Carl. Yeah, there was a lot of points. Um, just the first about the jury. I don't think Stevenson uh, implies that that jury was racist. Uh, he definitely implies that the judge was, and I think there's strong evidence of it. Um, but you're right, you know, the jury is, it, it deals with the evidence in front of it. I, I, have, no, I have not enough information to, to, to make a conclusion either way, but I, I, I think there is an important point that I'm glad you brought up so I can clarify. I'm not saying in any particular jury in the past that they were not ra or were not racist. What I'm saying to you is that, and I would say it to any lawyer at my firm that works with me, I don't want you coming in and telling me I lost this case because of a racist judge or a racist jury or a, ju a jury that doesn't believe in, um, in pl plaintiff's lawsuits or if you're in the civil defense bar, a, 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 har, a hell hole jurisdiction. You know, Mel makes his living and his life in jurisdictions where he's not supposed to win, but he goes in and wins. You know, that's your job. And that's one reason why we have trial school and why we're doing this so we can learn from each other so we can go in and win hard cases in tough jurisdictions. And since you took your oath to be a lawyer, I would say you should expect nothing less of yourself. So that's, Carl, I'm just saying, when you go in, I don't want to hear that the jury was racist. I'm not saying that this jury was racist. There are a lot of villains in the story. And Brian Stevenson is a, is a very good guide. No one's perfect, but he's a really good guide to what happened. Anyway, thank you, Carl. I appreciate all those points. Deborah, what, you wanted to say something? Let me unmute. Yes, I did. Um, just going back to the book, because I really, one of the things that really struck me about it and made me feel just overwhelmed was uh, the, the discussions that Brian had about the juvenile system and about putting these juveniles, these kids, who every single one of us as a teenager made bad choices. Um, you know, we lack judgment. I mean, that's one of the things that one of the hallmarks of being an adolescent. And then to have these states where people go from you know, being a teenager, and certainly some of these kids that he describes were in horrible, horrible situations where they had been abused, and then the state further abusing them by putting them into prison. Um, so that was one observation. The other one, because uh, we're talking about voir dire, I mean, I, you know, had a bunch of trials. I went to the trial lawyers college and all that kind of stuff, but there were a couple passages that I marked that I thought could be used as part of the voir dire. Um, on page uh, 289, I have the, the, the um, paperback. He, uh, 
he talks about um, the writer Thomas Merton. Uh, he says, we are bodies of broken bones. I guess I'd always known, but never fully considered that being broken is what makes us human. We all have our reasons. Sometimes we're fractured by the choices we make. Sometimes we're shattered by things we would never have chosen. But our brokenness is also the source of our common humanity, the basis of our shared search for comfort, meaning, and healing. Our shared vulnerability and imperfection nurtures and sustains our capacity for compassion. I mean, that would be a fabulous way to uh, bring a jury in to a situation where you're representing a criminal defendant. I'm, I mainly do plaintiff's work now, but I, I did do some criminal defense early on. But, um, you know, getting to a, a jury's compassion about I, I, uh, Yeah, yeah. That's, that's really, it's really beautiful. And it comes in later when he, when he, he talks about how he too is broken. It's beautiful. Right. He's a beautiful writer too. Um, uh, the other one, I just wanted to say the other one that struck me was when he talked about the stone catchers, because right. there's a biblical reference and uh, where he talks about uh, the woman who was accused of adultery and was brought to Jesus and he said, yeah, who, who among you has no sin cast the first stone. And he told the congregation that we can't simply watch it happen. We have to be stone catchers. I just thought that was really beautiful and something you could use in the closing too, besides what you're Yep. I That's my that. contribution. <laughs> Thank you, Deborah. I appreciate it. All right. So um, the last thing we're going to talk about today is I told you that I think other than the skills that we always talk about, there are two fundamental uh, ways to that you can become a better lawyer, a better human being. And one we already talked about was blind spots. The other one is hope. Yeah, there's, there's so many things that, uh, that I think we know are wrong and yet we accept because it feels like we are one individual that's powerless to change them. He says in the book, um, I'm not sure the page because I printed this out, but he says, I was developing a maturing recognition of the importance of hopefulness in creating justice. I'd started addressing the suspect of the subject, <laughs> not the suspect, the subject of hopefulness in talks to small groups. I'd grown fond of quoting Vaclav Havel, the great Czech leader who had said that hope was the one thing that people struggling in Eastern Europe needed during the era of Soviet domination. Not that pie in the sky stuff, not a preference for optimism over pessimism, but rather an orientation of the spirit, the kind of hope that creates a willingness to position oneself in a hopeless place and be a witness that allows one to believe in a better future even in the face of abusive power, the kind of hope that makes you strong. And so that's from his book. And, but I want to bring, I want to tell you a story that's actually not in his book, but it's about one of his clients, another one of his clients who is innocent and who wrote a book of his own called The Sun Does Shine. It's Anthony Ray Hinton. And this, this, this really, really moved me, a, a part of this book as I was reading. Um, and it gave me hope. Um, I ha he, he, there's another book called The Lynching, um, which I had luckily already read when I came across this passage, or I might not have put everything together. But this is the story of the last Klan lynching in the United States in the early 1980s in Mobile, Alabama. And it's a very detailed story. And the villains are very clear, as you can imagine, uh, a lynching of a young, just, uh, they just, they, it was the Klan, and they just happened to come across some poor black kid, and because of the color of his skin, they grabbed him and lynched him. These are villains. This is evil. But this is what happens when Anthony Ray Hinton goes on death row. Um, he, um, he was another one of Stevenson's clients, and um, he, one night, he, he, he kept to himself on death row. He couldn't see anyone in the other cells. They were basically in solitary. And one night, he heard a, a guy crying. Um, and uh, he, didn't, he, 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 um, he decided to speak to him, and he found out that the guy's mother had just died. Listen, I yelled, God may sit high, but he looks low. He's looking down here in the pit. He's sitting high, but he's looking low. You've got to believe it. I had to believe it, too. I heard an amen from somewhere else on the row. It's, ha it's a hard loss to bear, but your mom's looking down on you too. I know, thanks. I asked him, 
to tell me about his mom and listened for the next two hours as he told story after story. His mom seemed a lot like my mom, tough but full of love. He finished telling the story about her making a dress for his sister at a tablecloth and two soup cola cases so she could go to a school dance in a new dress. He started crying again, but softer. I wondered why it is that cries of another human being, whether it's a baby or a woman in grief or a man in pain, can touch us in ways we don't expect. I wasn't expecting to have my heart break that night. I wasn't expecting to end three years of silence. Then later in the book, I had no, I, I'd, I ha, I'd had no idea that my friend Henry was actually Henry Hayes, who I knew from the lynching. I walked back to my shower in shock. I knew who Henry Hayes was. Everybody in Alabama knew that he and a couple of other white guys had lynched a black boy named Michael Donald in Mobile in 1981. It was the last lynching. Henry Hayes' father was rumored to be head of the KKK. I went back to my cell that night and stared at the ceiling. I was Henry's friend. He knew I was black. I wanted to talk to him. I wanted to understand. Henry, I yelled, what do you want, Ray? I just figured out who you are. I didn't know. There was no answer right away, and I wondered what Henry was thinking. Everything my mom and dad taught me was a lie, Ray. And then a few chapters later, on the next visiting day, Henry had a visit too. Ray, come here for a second. He gestured me over. Ray, I want you to meet my father, Benny. Dad, this is Ray Hinton, my friend. I held out my hand to Henry's father. He just looked at me. He didn't say hello, and he would not shake my hand. He's my friend, Henry's voice said, shaking. He's my friend. He's my best friend. I walked back to my table. What was that all about, asked Lester. That was about some progress, my friend. Some crazy progress on death row. So that always moves me, man. I mean, that guy, you, you hate him in this book. And then, and then I find him again in another book. And there was some crazy progress on death row. Um, and so it made me think, and, that, and, and, and Hinton was one of uh, Stevenson's wrongfully accused clients that he had uh, freed. So I think the most important thing that Brian can teach us and the thing that I took from this book, and I think I hope you will take with you into your practice is hope. Everyone can, even acting alone, everyone, every single human being can make a difference. And we must, because that's our oath. We're lawyers, we must make a difference. So as Brian said, let's go earn our medals. Thank you guys, see you next week, next month. <laughs>